Hi. So tonight or today or whenever we're going to talk about redox, oxidation reduction reactions. That is a third type of reaction that can occur in solution, which is what this unit is about, reactions in solution. The first type we talked about was precipitate reactions in solution, where you mix two solutions and you get a precipitate. Then we talked about acid-base reactions, where you mix acids and bases, which are in solution, and you neutralize them. So this is the third type. We're going to call it redox. First, a couple of definitions. Oxidation, we're going to define as meaning losing electrons. Let's give an example. If you lose electrons, that would be like if you had a sodium atom and it lost an electron to become Na+, an ion. That's, this is an example of oxidation. Now let's give an ex a definition of reduction. Reduction is, you guessed it, gaining electrons. An example of something being reduced, or of reduction, would be chlorine, chlorine gaining an electron to become the chloride ion. That's an example of something chlorine being reduced or reduction. How can you remember this, Mrs. Irwin? This is how. Here's one way. Oil rig. This is a mnemonic device. Oil rig stands for oxidation. I should have written this. Hold on. Oxidation is losing. That's what oil stands for. Oxidation is losing. Reduction is gaining. Oil rig. That's how you can remember it. There's also another mnemonic called Leo goes Gur, like Leo the lion. I don't like this one as much, but whatever. Leo goes Gur. Losing electrons oxidation. That's the Leo. Gur, like a lion going Gur. Gaining electrons reduction. That would be the Gur part. Pick the mnemonic device you like better. You have to remember that oxidation is losing, reduction is gaining one way or the other. So now we're going to talk about oxidation reduction reactions, which are reactions where something is oxidized and something else is reduced. So something loses electrons and something else gains electrons. Another way of saying that is electrons are transferred in an oxidation reduction reaction. Electrons are transferred. Uh, short, an abbreviation for oxidation reduction reactions, lots of times we call them redox. Redox. But in, a, in these reactions, electrons are transferred. In this unit, we're going to be thinking about redox reactions where one of the reactants is a metal in its elemental form, so a, a metal. Um, but redox reactions are very important in biology and geology. They're, super, they're the reason we have batteries. Um, they're the reasons we have fuel cells, and we're going to work more with batteries later on in the year. Um, an example of a redox reaction is is the corrosion of a metal. Now you don't have this, these pictures in your notes, I know, but these are three examples of the corrosion of metal. In the Statue of Liberty, you have copper being corroded. So when copper is corroded, the copper, I should move this, the copper, where's my pen, is oxidized to Cu plus 2. And once it becomes this ion, then this ion forms um, compounds with carbonates and hydroxides, which is what, why you get the green color outside of copper. That oxidation stays on the, 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 that's okay, it stays on the outside of the Statue of Liberty. But when iron, this is an example of iron, is oxidized, it's, it's worse for the iron and the things that are made with iron. In this case, the iron is oxidized or loses electrons to become Fe plus 3, and once it's an ion of iron, it then combines with oxides and hydroxides to make rust and really eats away at the inside of the iron. If you've ever seen silver tarnish, that is silver being oxidized to Ag plus 1. And this brown, this dark color on the outside of silver, silver ions actually then combine with sulfur to make silver, uh, silver sulfide. That's what's on the outside of your silver stuff. But anyway, these are three examples of redox reactions in real life. Let's look and see how they happen on the particulate level. So this is the picture you have in your notes, and this is a different metal, calcium. 
um, calcium is mixing with oxygen, but what's, what's really happening here is the calcium, which is the solid, so it's this green thing, green atoms all together, and they are, the calcium is losing electrons to the oxygen. So the calcium loses the electrons to the oxygen. The oxygen gains the electrons. So then you have calcium has gone from calcium to Ca plus 2. And this was the oxidation. The oxygen, which is meant to be um, symbolized by these red diatomic things, the oxygen has gone from, I'll write it up here, O2 to O minus 2. It's split up and each gained two electrons. And so then, let me get my a different color, this combines with this because you have plus 2 and minus 2 and they make an ionic compound which is CaO. And that is is the tarnish that you see. So this is how it happens on the particulate level. So if we're going to have electrons being transferred, some things losing, some things gaining, we need a way to keep track of our electrons in a redox reaction. And that is where oxidation numbers come in. Oxidation numbers allow us to keep track of the electrons, who's losing, who's gaining. And before we start keeping track of the electrons in the whole reaction and balancing um, redox reactions and writing net ionic, net redox reactions, first we're going to practice just calculating or figuring out the oxidation numbers in simple compounds. And there are a few rules that we're going to follow. Um, and before we, so oxidation numbers allow us to keep track of electrons in reactions. And really, you should think about oxidation numbers as being kind of imaginary charges, okay? You know, we learned ions have real electric charges. Well, now we're going to assign electrons to everything in a reaction. So an oxidation number is kind of like an imaginary charge for each element. So let's see what we mean. Our first rule of, of figuring out oxidation numbers is that for an atom in its elemental form, right here, the oxidation number is always zero. So examples, for each atom in H2, H, that is H, hydrogen in its elemental form is, a, is hydrogen gas, we write it as H2, so this would have an oxidation number of zero. P4, you're not as familiar with that, but that's phosphorus in its elemental form. It would have an oxidation number of zero, an imaginary charge. That's why I'm writing it up here. It's where we write our charge, an imaginary charge of zero. Oxygen, O2, the oxygen that we breathe, imaginary charge of zero. That's its oxidation number. What else is there? Chlorine gas, Cl2, you write like that. That's, it. that's the elemental form of chlorine. By elemental form, we mean how it exists when it's an element. when you write it, it is an element. This would be zero. Let's think of a different example. If you just had sodium metal, the sodium metal that is shiny and soft, just it's not an ion, the sodium metal, the, the charge would be zero because it's not an ion. Okay, next. For any monatomic ion, and all these are written on your paper, the oxidation number equals the ionic charge. In this case, it's not an imaginary charge, it's a real charge. So K plus is has an oxidation number of plus one. S minus two has an oxidation number of minus two. Aluminum minus three, the ion, should be aqueous, would have an oxidation number of minus three. Hopefully you get the idea. So nonmetals over here on this side of the periodic table usually have negative oxidation numbers, but sometimes they can be positive, but usually they're negative, and this is how we go about figuring them out. First of all, oxygen is usually minus two in both ionic and molecular compounds. So whether you're dealing with um, glucose, C6H12O6, which is molecular, coval um, covalently bonded, or you're dealing with uh, sodium oxide. Either way, oxygen would usually be minus two. There's an exception. There's always exceptions. In a peroxide, then oxygen's going to have a charge of minus one. And the, the example that you're going to have to remember is hydrogen peroxide. It's H2O2. Otherwise, we won't be working with any peroxides here. So usually minus two for oxygen. That helps a lot. 
The oxidation number for hydrogen is usually plus one when it's bonded to nonmetals. So an example would be hydro hydrochloric acid, HCl, chlorine being a nonmetal. In that case, the hydrogen would have an oxidation number of plus one. The chlorine would have an oxidation number of minus one. Um, however, if the hydrogen is bonded to a metals, we call that a hydride. Um, so let's say you have sodium hydride. So there the sodium is a metal. Then the hydrogen would have a negative one charge. Most of the time, you're going to see it bonded to nonmetals, but you could see it happen. When it's bonded to nonmetals, it goes first. When it's bonded to metals, it's second. Fluorine is nice because fluorine is always minus one. The oxidation number of fluorine is always minus one. Remember, fluorine is the most electronegative compound, so it's going to gain electron and electron when it can, so no exceptions there. The other halogens, like chlorine, bromine, iodine, are usually minus one. So other halogens, usually minus one, but they can, um, they can have exceptions. But for fluorine, good old fluorine, even though it's poisonous, um, it's always minus one. Finally, the sum of oxidation numbers in a compound must equal zero. So NaCl, well, that's ionic, but um, this would be plus one, this would be minus one. This plus one plus minus one is zero. Um, hydrogen chloride, you have plus one and minus one. They equal zero. So in a compound, the sum of your oxidation numbers, whether you have two things or whether it's like glucose and you have three, in this case for C6H12O6, the oxygen would be minus two, and you have six of them, so six times minus two is a total of minus 12 imaginary charge. The um, hydrogen is usually plus one, and you have 12 of them, so that's plus 12. And since plus 12 plus minus 12 is zero, the oxidation number on the carbon here would be zero because you, you can't add or subtract anything else. So that's for compounds. The, the total charge, the total oxidation number has to add up to zero. Now, in an I, a polyatomic ion, the sum of all the oxidation numbers in a polyatomic ion must add up to the charge on the ion. And the example on your paper is the hydronium ion H3+. Plus. So again, ox oxygen in this case is going to have an uh, oxidation number of minus 2. Um, and so if we need the whole thing to add up to plus 1, and you have minus 2 here, then the hydrogen the hydrogen's going to then have to be plus 1, because 3 times plus 1 is plus 3, and plus 3 plus minus 2 equals plus 1 which is the charge on the ion. Let's practice. I think I have to check the length of this video. Actually, we're going to practice at the beginning of the next video. We'll do some practice problems.